Hello and welcome everybody to episode eight of the AISTS alumni talks today. And thank you all for joining us. Um, before we get started um, and before in introducing our topic and our speakers, I'd like to quickly thank the AISTS alumni committee for putting these talks together and making them available for not only our alumni, but a, a much, uh, much larger group. Um, we've been receiving some great feedback about uh, the first seven episodes, and uh, we're receiving a lot of requests for more and more of them. And so here we are today with episode eight. You'll notice that I nor Guillermo are your usual hosts, uh, Peter or Claudio, surprise. Um, these two are taking a well-deserved uh, break as they have some prior commitments. But like any great late night show or podcast, guest hosts are always welcome. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John Vlahos. Uh, I'm part of the 2019 ASTS alumni, and uh, I'm currently working at UEFA, um, helping to organize, amongst other things, Euro 2020, which I know that you are all eagerly anticipating. Um, and to present today's topic, as well as a brief overview of how the session will work, I'd like to hand over the floor to my co-host, Guillermo. Guillermo. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Guillermo, uh, as well from the 2019 class. And today we'll be talking about uh, sport innovation, which is one of my favorite topics. So I am more than happy to welcome our three guests to the episode eight of AISTS Alumni Talks. And our panelists today will provide an overview on sport innovation ecosystem, strategic innovation, digital transformation and disruptive initiatives within the sport ecosystem. So I'll just uh, would like to run down the format for everyone really quick. Um, we're going to have a 45 minute panel discussion with our expert and uh, John will introduce really shortly and we'll follow up this 45 minute panel discussion with a 15 minute Q&A session. After that, I will ask anyone uh, in attendance right now, who is not on the panel, please make sure that your camera is off and that your mic is muted. So if you do have any question, please uh, hit the raise hand icon on your screen. And when the time comes, uh, we'll ask you to turn on your mic and your camera and please address to the expert uh, panel. Um, and I'll, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, this uh, uh, episode is being recorded and uh, we do share it on our social media channels, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube. So I'll ask to please uh, keep your language appropriate and, you know, be dressed or at least covered as best as you, as you can in front of the camera. And uh, yeah, John, do you want to introduce our panel? Yes, thanks for that, Guillermo. Uh, I'm covered just enough for, uh, for the video, I think. Um, our first panelist is uh, Anna Hellman. Anna Hellman has been an integral part of the international sports movement for much of her professional career. Over the past four years, she's launched, managed, and currently serves as the director of ThinkSport. Anna has also been involved with Sport Accord, Alam International, IKEA, and she's even helped develop an avalanche rescue system in Switzerland, France, and Italy. I'm not sure that uh, we'll get to that last point today, but I'm sure we could have an entire alumni talk dedicated to that topic. Thank you for joining us today, Anna. Thank you for having me. I'll move on to our second panelist, uh, Hisham Shahabi, born in Bahrain and currently joining us from Bahrain. Uh, Hisham is shaping the future role of sports organizations in the Olympic industry by accelerating their transformation and modernization and leveraging trends and technology innovation, and investments. Ha having competed at the Olympic Games, his Olympic journey continued uh, as a member of the International Olympic Committee, where he's led topics related to future trends in sports. As co-founder and chief operating officer at Next Sports, he divides his time between Olympic client relations, partnerships, and emerging markets with a particular focus on Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. I should also take the opportunity to note that Hisham is an ASTS alumni, part of our 2015 cohort. Welcome, Hisham. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. And last but not least, we have Jean-Baptiste Alliot. Finally, um, he has worked in the sport industry for the past 10 years in multiple positions, which 
uh, led him to drive the innovation strategy within UEFA, where he set up the UEFA Innovation Hub. He is in charge of defining and implementing the innovation strategy at UEFA to support the organization in achieving the recently approved UEFA corporate strategy and close cooperation with the newly created UEFA Intelligence Center. Among his new responsibilities as Chief Strategy Officer at La Source, he is now in charge of supporting sports organizations in leveraging innovation, strategic collaboration, and partnerships with startups. Welcome, Jean-Baptiste. Hi there, thanks for having me. Well, everyone, um, we have our two hosts, our three panelists, and uh, let's get started. I will hand over to Guillermo to ask our first question today. Thank you, John. Uh, so there's uh, here's a warm up question. Uh, it's already one year that uh, COVID impacted uh, Europe and uh, events started, started uh, shutting down. So um, how do you see the, the sport innovation ecosystem after this, this whole year? I'll start with Anna in alphabetic order. So uh, please, Anna, the floor is yours. I think it has been um, a very humbling year and an amazing year. Humbling in the way that we have um, a tendency to say that we are the greatest, we are the biggest, we are the most intelligent. And then suddenly there is a small bacteria that we have probably created also that just puts us down on the, on the ground and everything comes to a stop. And now we have to figure out how do we continue? And obviously, as you said, I mean, everything when it comes to the events also came to a stop, but I'm amazed to see how people have been creative, innovative to find solutions of, if we're not just talking about elite sport, but also sport as a physical activity, how people have found ways of, of, of using digital solutions and turning their homes into uh, fitness centers and using kitchen gears for, for weights or whatever it is, it shows that we have the power to progress and be uh, proactive if we have to. So, so I hope I'm saying this in the way like positive, it's not positive at all, the COVID, but we still have that, we need to have a positive mind on this. Um, and I think that also the whole digital side, uh, the, 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 uh, the gamification, the e-sport, this has been an intensive course uh, to understand what may come in the future. And I'm sure there will be a before and an after COVID. Thank you, Anna. And uh, I'll pass the question to uh, uh, Hisham. Uh, Hisham, please, uh, what, did, what are your thoughts on, on this topic? Quite a macro topic. Usually I'm not uh, taking much time to think too much uh, outside of my, uh, my week to week uh, agenda, but it is actually a year since uh, we stopped uh, flying around like crazy uh, to meetings that required, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face, um, you could do now uh, through digital means. And so I think what has changed is um, our understanding of how to do business in the sports industry. Um, obviously, uh, network and connections are still important. And uh, it seems like the, the language around uh, the business of sports has changed, uh, which, is, which is quite exciting. You know? So that's, um, I think, something that's accelerated very quickly in the last year. Um, you see now new stakeholders coming in that were maybe knocking on the door of sports over the last few years, uh, but haven't really been front and center. You know? So uh, investment groups and, and tech companies, uh, great startups you know, who have always been around the ecosystem, but have not really taken center stage. And, in the last year, it feels like that's what happened. And so it's great to, I was uh, speaking to a National Olympic Committee from the east of, um, of Europe. Um, let's say a region you wouldn't associate with uh, kind of the most advanced uh, technology solutions. And the marketing director, when I asked her what her role was, she said, I'm the direct to consumer uh, manager at the NOC. And I was shocked for, for many reasons. First, because an NOC said, direct to consumer. Uh, and second, from where this, this uh, term came from, uh, from a small NOC, you know, so what seemed to be, I think, out of reach for a lot of different organizations and sports is now within reach. Uh, everything is accessible and maybe there's a bit too much noise sometimes, uh, but really like um, I think Anna was saying, the opportunity, it's been an amazing year from like just expanding our horizons as an industry, thinking about opportunities differently, uh, thinking about our value proposition as an entity differently because suddenly we don't have events that are the lifeblood of, of, 
uh, of our organizations, you know, so a lot of really positive things to take away from. And uh, whereas in the beginning of COVID, I thought like, you know, this, this will only be a blip, you know, it's three months and then everybody will go back to business as usual. Now, I think we've reached the point where it's, it's, you, you can no longer say business as usual after this. Too much has happened, too much has changed and a, a lot of positive developments from that. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys much, for, for this. <laughs> yeah. what, what else can I say? No, I mean, just like in, in every industry, for me, it's like COVID has just been an accelerator of already known trends. So like what Anna and just Isham said, for me at the end of the day is like the, the trends we were seeing, the shifts within the, the landscape and the industry that were already there back in 2016, even early in the 2010s uh, decades. Uh, I think COVID-19 has just like built the momentum or made the case. Uh, I think some, some of the sports organizations were aware or there was some kind of a understanding that sports organization needed to adapt to a new landscape, to a new, I would say to the sports and entertainment uh, sector. But I think COVID-19 has just like accelerated everything and you don't really need anymore to make a case. I think now it's more like, how do I do it? So for me, I mean, I don't know if it's positive or negative. I, I, will, I will leave that to other experts or anything. It's just like, we have to cope with it. We, the sports organization on their own have been quite clever and innovative in terms of redefining how they will bring value, how they are rethinking their processes, how they're going to deliver events, uh, return to their protocols, uh, especially in football, when we're the first ones to, to restart, even behind closed doors. So I, ultimately, I think it shows also how, how reactive we can be. But for me, it's, it's just like, yeah, it, they, they, they will not be a new normal. I mean, we cannot be back to, to what it used to be. And, COVID-19 has just so much accelerated everything. And, and even the kind of habits and routines from, you mentioned consumers, mentioned, you can say fans or consumers that are the same, but the, the, the routines, the habits will be completely changed. And so we need also to rethink everything around that. So, so yeah, quite promising for, for the year months ahead of us. <laughs> If, if I may add, I think that what we have all said is that it has really also put forward the weaknesses in many areas. And now we can't, we cannot hide from these weaknesses. We have to sort of take care of them and we have to go forward. And, and if there is a new culture, there is a mind shift and, and there is a clear shift in behavior. And, and also where sort of say the, the um, how are we going to consume certain things in, in the future? And, and, and how do people want this? And I think that the, the shift over to the fan and the audience and to sort of say the outside has become bigger and bigger. And we need to respond to this also in a good way now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. You, you spoke about uh, the weaknesses and uh, it's kind of uh, related uh, to, to my next question. Um, what do you think uh, are the most common misconceptions when, when people are trying to innovate in the sport industry and how we can combat um, these uh, misconceptions and, and communicate more effectively? I mean, uh, sport innovation is a very buzzword and there's uh, many definitions. So how do you see this in, in, in the future, uh, Hisham? Uh, I saw JB smiling, so I thought uh, you'd ask him. Uh, yeah, yeah, go for it, JB. I think you're you're better placed on this one to start us off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. I mean, innovation has been, I mean, I've been on it. And for me, first, everybody thinks like when you do innovation, you're working with startups. So that's not, that's not just that. So doing a demo day or working with a startup is not being innovative. Uh, at the same time, people tend to think of innovation just purely digital or technology related. Uh, and even like uh, marketing, uh, fan consumption. At the end of the day, I think for me or the way we've been positioning it at the UEFA Innovation Hub is how you anticipate the future and how you make sure you remain relevant. So it's way more 360 
approach. So it's the entire organization and it's how you operate with agility. So at the end of the day, of course, you will leverage what's happening outside. Of course, you will acknowledge and understand that digital and new technologies are playing a crucial role in changing the industry and the landscape and the younger generation and that you need to adapt. But at the end of the day, putting an innovation strategy is just how you make sure you're going to remain relevant and putting your values and what's your strategic objectives at the core of it. So if participation, because I can imagine that's few people in the audience are working for sports organization, if one of your key strategic priorities is around competitive balance, participation, so good governance, you can be innovative also in these areas. You don't need to use only uh, augmented reality or this kind of immersive experience or the metaverse or gaming to say you are innovative. You can come up with very much innovative solutions or even innovative processes. And at the end of the day, I think it's good because now it's very much of a buzzword and startups always come back. Uh, while I think for me, innovation is also at the end of the day, it's 99% processes. So it's how you make sure you put the right culture, the right processes within an organizations that build an ecosystem to actually leverage uh, innovation for its own strategic initiative. So I think that's the, the misconception usually around innovation that tech related startups, fans, uh, new technologies, yeah. it's way more than that. It's business transformation. I, I agree with you. And I think it's interesting also perhaps to say, what do we mean with innovation? What does it mean? And if you look and you Google, you will find lots of different definitions. The one that I seem to like the best is innovation is something fresh that creates value. Um, and then you can take it in any, any way you want. But it also, as you say very rightly, GB, it's also HR, it's also governance, it's many other things. It's not just tech. And it doesn't have to always be costly because it could also be changes of behaviors and routines. And, and it needs to really be understood uh, from all the departments and all through the organization. Yeah. If I, I'll add to uh, Anna and JB, something like just a reflection on the last few years, uh, trying to push the, the topic of innovation within the sports industry. It's, it doesn't help to box it into like a specific definition uh, because You'll, you'll see it used in many, many different contexts and it means different things to different people within different organizations. It's, it's come up more now in strategic plans and, and mandates you know, to be more innovative and to have innovation at the center of what we do. Uh, but it's yet to take on the structure of perhaps other industries where innovation is really like, a, like a, an actual department, an actual process, an actual strategy in place. It's starting to show up in places uh, and kind of the work that uh, JBU did with UEFA, for example, is one of the like clear outliers, I would say, in terms of an, a strategy actually coming out and, and being set. Uh, but in lots of cases, you know, uh, the organizations in sports do not see themselves as um, ecosystem orchestrators, right? They see themselves as sitting on top and, and pushing down instead of like at the middle of an ecosystem that they need to orchestrate to, to generate that value, you know? So that's that's something that's um, gonna take time to change, you know? So if you look at things like gender equality, um, for, for gender equality to be where it is today in the Olympic movement, back in the mid 2000s, there needed to be a specific uh, quota in place for the number of female members on boards to reach the point we are today, where it's kind of like uh, a foregone conclusion that you talk about that. So. I, to bring that level of um, integration of innovation into sports, it will take a long time. And we're probably just seeing the first phase of, of it entering sports and to look a bit different in the next few years. Excellent, thank you, Hisham. I wanna jump on a point that uh, Anna had mentioned and I really liked it. What does innovation mean? Um, so I wanna ask each of you, what does innovation mean for you as well as your, your company? What does it mean for the source and think sport and next sports and how are your companies and organizations uh, positioning themselves in the near future to ensure that you remain at the forefront of, of innovation. Maybe we can start with with Anna. I mean, we, we ourselves, if you say think sport, we, we are in the so say we are a facilitator and we're a booster, the only 
expertise we, we try to say that we have is to be able to boost and, 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 and connect people together. And we realize the importance of, of being uh, flexible, agile, not um, looking in to say that we've done this now, so now we can stay with the same thing, kind of question ourselves all the time. Are we doing it in the right way? Can we do it in a different way? What kind of new thinking can we bring into our organization and how can we um, bring in also the ecosystem around us in, in, a, in a different way of, of, of going forward? But I think that the whole, for me, to be creative and, and creating ideas and then the innovation is then to put this in, in place and, and to deliver um, a solution and, and to go on. Uh, but I think it will be extremely important to be very open-minded, um, to be curious in the future, and, and to be uh, positive to change and new behavior. Thanks, Anna. Jean-Baptiste, you're next on my screen. To, uh, maybe I'll jump <laughs> to you. Happy. Well, me, me is rather short. I will give you the, the web innovation uh, definition we have for innovation. So innovation is about future-proofing yourself and your organization. Uh, and so it's how you operate with flexibility to remain relevant. Okay, and uh, Hisham, anything to add? Uh, not, not much. I think it's been said in the last few answers as well, to be honest, like in terms of the process, the strategy, becoming part of an ecosystem, generating value. It really has looked different with different clients we've worked with. Um, but there is, as you said, uh, JB, a bias towards technology even though I guess the, the understanding is expanding a little bit. Mm -hmm. it's, if I may pick up on what you just said, that I think that the, uh, the, the, the tech side, I mean, whatever we decide to put in as a new solution, we still need the resources, the human resources to follow this also. So the HR side is for me something that is very important not to forget, because if we do have a solution, we have a strategy in place that we want to deliver, how do we do that uh, with the organizations? How do we educate, form, and, and, and help people to sort of say, follow these strategies afterwards and also find the skills and the expertise that we will need in the future? I think that's a fairly big chapter that we're going into also. Mm -hmm. I think I will just jump here because for those of you who are interested in this, we are touching, for me, one of the key challenges of any innovation initiative that you want to implement. So within the Welfare Innovation Hub, we have three different strategic objectives. The first one is actually cultivate around how to, to foster a culture of innovation. And so clearly it's all about the processes, but how you embark and how you raise awareness among your staff and how you create innovators within your own organization. And that's not an easy thing. And usually this is not what people are thinking about when you think about innovation. Um, and so it's, it's a bit between, okay, how do I do change management? How do I do business transformation along with HR, but along with other more corporate or traditional uh, business units, directions within your own organization? And at the same time, how do I leverage? So how do I connect with the outside? How do I leverage the ecosystem which is outside? Uh, and so you have also all these needs within the innovation lab, within an entrepreneurship journey, within whatever schemes you are deciding to implement, there's this need to educate and to accompany the staff also to understand that there can be their own innovators. And ultimately the goal for, I think, any innovation initiative is that at the end of the day, you are no longer needed uh, to actually push for innovation because everybody will, will be his own innovator and will contribute to the overall strategy on its own. So I think, I think this is one of the key challenges when we speak about innovation and driving value for an organization is you need to do this kind of understanding internally of the internal capabilities. And this is actually one of the main weaknesses for sports organizations because we don't have the infrastructure. We're not born in the 21st century like many other industries, but at the same time, we have not had many engineers or many people that come from the data worlds or even from just like the automotive or um, Airbus company, people that are engineers and so with innovation processes and with other mindsets and with other skills. And so at the end of the day, this is also the level of maturity for innovation to, in, to, to appear or to be present within an organization also depends on that. And this is usually an area which is not looked at or not understood, or this is not something that pops out because 
even for the top management, they hear every day like, okay, we need to change, we need to adapt, we need to innovate because there is gaming, because of Fortnite, because of whatever. And so they really see it under the prism of, again, technology, gaming, startup, new technologies, which is, which is true. And this is something you need to leverage and you need to understand how you position yourself to orchestrate your ecosystem, like Isham was saying. But at the end of the day, you need to be aware that if you really want to remain in the driving seat, you will need to also internalize certain capabilities and certain skills, which today are lacking in most of the sports organizations. And that's not bad. That's just a reality. And you need to have a plan. You need to have a game plan to actually like make sure you you cope with the situation and get better. Oh. Okay, I, I was uh, shaking, uh, nodding my head a lot, I think, on, on the screen there, but I agree with everything you've said and, and like one reflection just in terms of like the growth of sports organizations and let's say the last two decades or even like going back three decades, you had lawyers always get to the top, right? Lawyers were the CEOs, they were the presidents, um, and it was because the international sports ecosystem was uh, about governance, you know, setting up its structure, its regulations, finding out where it sits in the world. And that, that was a clear need, you know, so you had your legal uh, directors becoming um, kind of secretary general in the case of uh, UEFA and then president of FIFA, right? And this has happened across the board in, in, in many cases. And now you see a little bit of more like the commercial side is, is starting to creep up and go up the ranks uh, because the new uh, kind of skills that needed at the top of the pyramid, let's say at the top of an organization, is the ability to regenerate a business uh, continuously, you know, and needing that um, uh, not not just you know uh, growing the existing pie, but looking for um, sorry, uh, growing the existing pie versus trying to take a bigger piece of the pie, and so this is um, yeah. this is going to be interesting to see. And to your point, uh, JB, with with the people and the and the structures that are needed, and kind of just the the, the kind of profiles coming into sports. It'll be interesting to see what uh, kind of new new talent comes through, both through kind of like administration programs like the AISTS, but also in leadership positions across um, organizations like UEFA, IOC, and, and otherwise. Yeah, I I will just I agree with you on the on the profile of the leaders and the legal background, and it's also the way you were, it's also the way the rights being media or even marketing rights or sponsorship were were dealt with. It was like mostly traditional. I mean, back at the start, it was only local fans with ticketing. Then you move to national and global fans with TV and new channels. But I would say the the way the business model and the degradation of everything was more or less the same. And, and legally, you were doing tenders, you were giving your property, and they were doing it more or less the same way. I think now today we what we can see as the uh, omni channels or of a shift completely in terms of landscape and new tech giants. And so what we called, anybody can call it the way they want, like the connected fan, if you want, which is no longer local, national, global, but really the connected fan is like transmedia, omni channel. And so you need to rethink completely the way you were packaging the rights, the way you, you, you are delivering value to your communities uh, and how new uh, stakeholders are coming in as well. And so I think that's why maybe it's coming, you're mentioning marketing, and I think it's it's coming from, from there or from the tech giants because they, they are the one leading the fourth industrial revolution. But at the same time, I think that there's still a mix at the top of some of uh, the international federations, but definitely the understanding of the technologies of this omni-channel, of this transmedia, of the data opportunity of, I mean, we will, we can expand on that, but this understanding of the new market and the new landscape and where the, the, the value lies, I think this is, this is where we, we need to look at as well from sports organizations. And that's not an easy one. That's a tricky one. And it's, it's a new area. And suddenly, I mean, we're not just talking sort of say the sport and the discipline, we're going out to the custom oriented side and we need to respond to uh, the, 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 the content that everybody's looking for and how we can reach out to them. So I think that it is clearly a different business model as you both say, and it's, it's a clearly a different way of working. 
and and uh, with this comes a big shift in the culture and in the sort of say skill set also inside an organization. Mm -hmm. But that, but I would not be. I mean, I fully agree uh, with you, Anna. But I would not be too pessimistic, or yeah. even for, with you, Hashem. It's. I think again, what what the pandemic or everything, what what it has showed us is like. At some point, I remember ten years ago, even five years ago, it was like, oh, we're gonna die, or it's gonna be over, or sports is gonna be like somewhere else. And I think constantly we we can see that communities. I mean, sports is crucial to the society and new generations are engaging, maybe in a different way, but they are still engaging with sports, whatever that is. And that's a terrific asset. I mean, that's like everybody is fighting for the attention of the, of the fans and so of the, of the consumers today. And we are lucky enough that we don't even have to fight for it because people are passionate and engaging on their own and giving their time for us. Mm. And I think, this is also the true value we have. And I think we need to, to think as well, like as sports organizations, we are not purely uh, profit driven. And I think here also, as part of the innovation, one of the key challenges that we have is when I'm thinking innovation is future proofing yourself is like, do you want to live in a world in 2030 or 2035 where football or sports is still the number one product consumed by generation? Yes, maybe that's my target. But do I want this world to be like still with COVID and more health, more sustainability crisis? I don't think so. So to a certain extent, we need also to drive innovation or we need to reposition the sports organization, not purely on the marketing and this uh, tech giant trend, but also like, okay, we want to increase participations because we believe in it because there is health benefits. There is social benefits to it. And, and I think we need also to, to remain true to our values, to, to, to make most of, of, of what we have to, to still engage, I think. I, I think I'm the one nodding as much as you did before, Hisham. Mm -hmm. I, you're completely right. And I think also that what becomes more and more clear is that we talk elite sport, we talk physical activity, we talk tourism, we talk health, we talk business, everything is interlinked. And, and more or less in any kind of sector within the ecosystem today, we find sport in one way or another. And that's really interesting, I think. And I think it's important for sport to take this in. Uh, when mm -hmm. there is an event that is being organized, it is perhaps um, more to also see how can we give um, other values to, to a host city? How can we give other values to the, the fans and the audience and the athletes? Because there is truly a need for sport and physical activity in a different way, in the, in the larger sense of the definition of sport. And, and we see this coming through also very much with, with the experience of COVID. Very interesting. And uh, we, we mentioned the uh, internal processes as a big step uh, for, for innovation. But I wanted to go uh, and ask you about the collaborative innovation. I know. Uh, well, uh, Think Sport, as you mentioned, and is uh, uh, a big uh, facilitator in sport innovation. Jean Baptiste was was also involved in the creation of the UEFA Innovation Hub, and Hisham uh, prepares uh, their, their clients uh, to to contact this this uh, whole uh, sport in innovation ecosystem. So, how do you build successfully one? Uh, uh, let's say uh, like startup challenges or you know uh, collaborative innovation that meets. Uh, the, the needs of the stakeholders. Maybe uh, Jean Baptiste, you can start with that one. Yeah, uh, sure. I think I think okay. So, for a bit of background for the audience, the Web Innovation Hub, we've launched different uh, challenges. So, with Think Sports back in 2019, we had the Web Startup Challenge. After that, we launched an open innovation scheme where we're not constrained by any timeline. And last year, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we reimagined a concept. Um, we launched a test which is called Reimagine Football, but we were not alone. So we had also our members of so the federations, leagues, clubs, and stadium owners to make sure innovation can happen at different levels and for different uh, needs uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I think on your questions on what does it take, I think, again, like what I was saying, an innovation strategy is not just sitting in a demo day, looking at one startup and saying, oh, that's cool, or I like the tech and 
we're going to have two months and we're going to test and that's it. I think you need to really, first, what's the vision? You, you need to, to, to take one step behind maybe to think about, okay, what's the corporate strategy? What do we try to achieve? Uh, and how either a business unit or an innovation business unit can help in terms of facilitating or achieving this. And then a challenge for working with the startups is one of the, of the possibilities. But, it, but innovation can take many forms. And so for me, it's important that people that are listening, they don't necessarily rush or jump into this because what we've done at UEFA might not be fit for you, or that was fit because based on the um, level of maturity I was referring to, the resources, the, the time to get results. So based on our internal capabilities, but also the, the matrix for innovation we, we have in place, we selected different schemes among which one startup challenge was was good because we knew the needs from the business units. We knew some of the pain points we needed to address. We also knew the buy-in from different people internally where we could have mentorship because that is key as well when you drive such initiative. I mean, I cannot do everything on my own. I'm not the experts of everything. I'm the experts of nothing. So at the end of the day, I'm just facilitating 99% of innovation processes. So what you will be doing is helping actually innovation to happen with the true experts within the business unit. So you can implement startup challenge, but I would say I would not necessarily encourage you to rush into this. I would rather ask you to take a, take a step back and really think like, okay, what, what is it for? What are we trying to achieve? What do we want to do? Is it internal, external? And, and based on this, then you can decide. So sorry, Guillermo, I don't have like direct answers to this, but I think it's important for any organization to really, uh, I would say, tackle this in a very strategic way. Again, it's you cannot really say, okay, we're going to do innovation because we, don't, we want to look cool and we're going to do an accelerator and work with startups. And at the end of the day, you, you do something, but nothing happens or you still name the same startup four years after because there is nothing concrete that's happening. So I think at the end of the day, and Anna touched upon it, it's for me, innovation, for the sake of innovation will never work. So what drives value for you? And based on this and based on your uh, internal capabilities and, and the audit you've done, you can decide which kind of schemes can drive value. I also think that it's extremely important that we give time and, and resources to, to innovation or um, brainstorming and ideas so that people can actually bring forward, um, sort of say, suggestions and, and, and debate it a little bit in, in an organization. I think that we're all in the same situation where it's really hard to say time out and take a step back. But I think that that's going to be very important in the future to be able to do this, to find our own DNA for each organization and then sort of say, Put in place a strategy but i i don't think this is something that you do by yourself i think it's important to share and 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 uh, understand what goes on in other sectors and why solutions or ways forward have been chosen by other sectors or other companies or organizations and learn because it is a big um, a big learning process also yeah and if Maybe, i, if uh, I do, just do ahead, strategy, sorry Sham, i will be quick and after i, no, no, I shut ahead. up <laughs> <laughs> But usually there is a misconception, like when I'm helping business units internally or anything, it's people come to me or and tell me either I need this app or worse is like I need to do a brainstorm session or I need this ideation to, to think of something online. Innovation doesn't start with the solution. It doesn't start with the ideation or the, the brainstorming. It starts with the problem. And so you need first to really understand what's the problem. Can you refine it? Can you really understand the customer segments you are really trying to niche? Can you make sure you've uh, tested the assumptions? Because sometimes it's just you having these assumptions, but maybe it's good to call the broadcast partners, the sponsors, the teams on the ground, if it's for delivering an event. Whatever the issue you're having, you need to start with the problem first. Once you have tested and confirmed the problem, then you move to the solution part. And I think for innovation, it would be the same principles to be applied. Mm -hmm. So Isha. 
No, no, thank you. Thank, I think that was a good segue anyway. But uh, in terms of like uh, specific initiatives and innovation, uh, I would agree with everything Anna and JP said and add that momentum is important, you know, so moving beyond just the, the demo day and the last moment that there is a public and PR related event to it and really integrating it into what happens next. You know, how do you work with these new stakeholders you're working with? Um, how do you integrate them into existing programs? A lot of the, let's say, the interface between uh, partners uh, like sponsors and broadcasters are usually the commercial people. You don't, even though most of these um, partners around the Olympic movement, for example, are quite uh, technology friendly. They're one of the most innovative companies in the world. They're all platform companies. Uh, there is rarely um, a connection directly from the innovation and like design and engineering teams of those organizations and the sports organizations. And so sometimes innovation initiatives could be that meeting point where you, instead of talking to the marketing guys of like uh, Airbnb, for example, you are able to bring that say the design and engineering guys and the product guys into the conversation. So this is where maybe innovation could expand a little bit what's possible for a sports organization to do um, and to start generating new value. And so, yeah, there's a, a as you said, uh, probably earlier, uh, both of you, there, it's, it's really a lot of things, uh, but really it's, it's a chance to expand what value is being created by, uh, by an entity. Hmm. Moving from sponsorship to partnership. Mm -hmm. I like it, Isha. <laughs> okay, we've uh, reached the part of this uh, chat where we welcome questions from the audience. Um, we received a few already. Um, I think that I will start by inviting Ruben Machado. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question yourself and maybe direct it to one or more of our panelists. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what techniques um, do you use to identify what the problem is in a company? So if I have understood the questions, is like, how do you collect uh, the challenges of the pain points and so the, the business needs? Yeah, how do you identify the problems when they happen in another department that is not Innova the innovation department. Yeah, so maybe I can quickly answer. On, on our side, within the intelligence center at UEFA, you have data, innovation, and strategy. And so part of the strategy process the organization is actually to break down the challenges or the targets you have for a certain period of time. Usually, sports organizations do it for four years. So if your strategy plan is 2020, 2024, or 2022, 2026, uh, innovations comes as part of this strategy. So on our side, we've been doing a 360 review of the entire business or the entire organization. And so we were collecting the main uh, objectives for, for each of the divisions. So we were knowing exactly the business units, what they were needing. And then after it's also based on the top management priority, which one we need to prioritize and which one, which one we need to give access to. And then we have another way to do it. It's also, you can use a platform or the way we've been doing it internally, it's um, we have an innovation lab and there, there is ways to actually propose your project, but it's related also to HR and to entrepreneurship journey. So you have a, a four, like a one pager if you want, where you propose your project and for which you can work as a startup with your colleague from different business units to actually tackle these problems. And so you have an innovation funnel to make sure that you collect as much at the, at the beginning and, and goes through the different gates for, for further approval. I wonder, Anna yeah. or Hashem, do you have a, a, a different answer or anything to add? Well, I, I agree completely with what, I mean, GB says, and I think that it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we have so many ways of communication today, but communication is still the most difficult that we have and that we really need to stay in touch with all the different departments within an organization and to get to know what the pain points are to be able to find, so to say, solutions to it. So I think that the communication side is, is, is crucial. Yeah. yeah, I would add maybe just, uh, just on top of what uh, they said, uh, uh, like one of the tools that's useful with, with some of the clients we work with is like a prioritization matrix. It sounds very, very simple, but it's uh, an agreed upon set of criteria for which 
uh, it, it filters what comes in and, and what stays outside of this process. And so this, uh, as transparent and as early as possible that this decision-making mechanism, whatever it is, um, is communicated internally, the, the easier the process for filtering business requirements becomes. Excellent, thank you, three. And uh, thank you, Ruben, for that question. Next, I'll move to Eric. Eric, you had a question as well. Do you wanna unmute yourself and uh, address your question to the panelists? If not, uh, maybe I'll jump in and ask on his behalf. Um, Eric's question was, how does value distribution play a role in sports innovation? Are we moving from a top-down value distribution approach to a horizontal value distribution? Uh, maybe Hisham, do you want to take the first stab at this question? Yeah, I'll take a stab <laughs> um, because I it, it may be interpreted in different ways. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll speak at it from like um, an ecosystem versus pyramid approach. Um, so, you know, uh, let's say historically, there has been a focus on kind of um, um, centralizing the most amount of resources at the top and then distributing them uh, downwards. There hasn't been an approach to like co-creating value um, from the bottom to the top as well. So um, whereas today, for example, let's take an example of an international federation, it sees itself as um, kind of like the uh, the, the holder of the of the safe, you know, on behalf of all of the national federations, and then we distribute it uh, to you guys, yeah, and you give us the mandate every four years to be able to take this responsibility. The view isn't how do I, as an international federation, start to partner with these national federations to start to experiment and create new products and services. And so I think I'd love to see the day when that becomes a reality and where it's not a political move to work with one national federation versus another. And that goes down to like how voting happens and the governance of, of IFs, for example. Um, are we moving there yet? I don't think so. Um, I think we're moving towards a, a, a model where we're partnering with, uh, let's say, more people at the top. So the IFs are partnering with tech companies, with investors, et cetera, but not necessarily with the rest of the pyramid as much. And they're still seeing it as Let's try to create more value here at the top and distribute it rather than let's start to work with the whole ecosystem. I don't know if that um, answers your question, Eric, but that's just how I thought about it. And now, or, or JP, anything to, to add to this? Mm, not necessarily. I, I struggle yeah. a bit to understand the, the value distribution, to be honest with you. Uh, what that means in terms of like, is it the, the reference of the revenues, like what Isham was mentioning? Or, I mean, I, I struggle with it. Or is it a top-down approach internally where we need to empower more the business units and less having like some kind of a pyramid ways of working? So I'm, I'm not too confident that I understand really well the questions, to be honest. Unfortunately, I have to say the same thing. I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for that. Let's, uh, let's jump to the next question then. Uh, Fiona, if you're there, um, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and, uh, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Fiona Bull. I'm from the World Health Organization in Geneva, and I'm very pleased to join for my first time this uh, really interesting discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for mentioning the promotion of physical activity and the importance of physical activity for health for, uh, for a whole range of reasons. But I'd like to then push further onto some of your responses and ask for more about how the trends and directions of the, um, of the sport industry and the innovation and the direction of the in innovation um, could perhaps be used and applied for the purposes of promoting participation. My fear is, and my challenge, is that this is all about a consumer and a fan who's watching and who's consuming, streaming in all new ways, and it's in, increasing enjoyment and in, increasing participation uh, passively. 
how can we turn that around and what can we learn um, from your experiences to inform the agenda, which I'm sure you're all aware about, and that's to get more participation and to recover from COVID. So we need the innovation that Anna was speaking to. And I know it's something that many of you are interested in. So I just, it's a big question and I, I, I'd just like to open it up. Thank you. It is a big question. And, 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 and I think that it is also a very important question because participation will also um, grow an interest for people to be part and watch a sport and, 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 and feel that they are part of it. I don't have the figures and the statistics and you may be able to help me, but, but in some countries anyway, and I mean, I realize that we are spoiled living now in Switzerland and Europe in some other countries. I have the feeling that the COVID has actually put the finger on this and, and, and proven the necessity of us to be able to move and, and to do this in different ways and to be creative about it. And, and that the um, innovation in many ways of tracking and, and different other tools that we can use is actually motivating people also to do this. I also realize that we're talking about, again, um, solutions that may not be cheap, uh, but I feel also that people are today understanding that just the fact of going out, just the fact of being outside and get oxygen uh, has been important because sitting in front of this screen I never have, if ever I have a creative idea, I don't have it in front of a screen. I have it when I'm out hiking or biking or whatever I'm doing. And I think from what I see around me, um, people seem to also feel the same way a little bit today. But I don't have the statistics, so I can't say anything about it. Can I, can I jump in? I will give you a very concrete example based on what we've done at the Wi-Fi Innovation Hub. Back in 2019, we started a cooperation with a startup. And you're right, at the end of the day, venture capital or what's coming from the market, they want to, to make profit. So definitely they are not here to increase participation, but how they can sell more and how they can like D2C, so direct to consumer and engage more. But the role of Wi-Fi is to increase participation. So what we did with these startups, they came with a concept that with using your iPhone, you could track your performance. So knowing how you shoot the, the ball. And we told them that's cool. We can do that for a fan zone. So based on your speed and your accuracy, you can have a tuple score. But we told them what we want to develop is a UEFA player card. And by building a UEFA player card, you have shooting, dribbling, passing, jumping, velocity. So you have six core skills that any kids, boys and girls can go in the garden or can play with their mates and they can practice it. The beauty of it is just like, I'm not necessarily in favor of more and more digital, but at the end of the day, it's like you have to realize that the kids, if you want to engage with them, you need, you need to make it sexy as well for them, or you, you need to go where they are. And if we stay where we are, we will never engage or talk to them. So we are building this, but you know what? They can also upload it, maybe in FIFA game in the coming months, you will see that. And the only way actually for them to improve their game or their virtual cards will not be to play more on their couch, but they will have to go back in the garden. So this is just a simple way to say, okay, we live in a digital, between physical and digital. How can I use digital as part of this equation or as part of the solution to address strategic needs for one organizations like UEFA, where we want to increase football participation. But that's one example of the UEFA player card and what we've been developing. More recently, I will not name the name of the startups because that makes no sense, but we are also starting new pilots with other startups around the tracking technologies. Obviously the investments at first were not necessarily for philanthropy or for the SDGs of this world. Uh, so for the sustainable development goals, but ultimately what we're trying to do is to use it to have better talent scouting, better development pathway so that academies for minors can actually be uh, more relevant and more efficient in engaging with young boys and young girls. So at the end of the day, it's just like technology is out there, you can source it, you can be in touch with it. And then because you have a unique position where startups or different companies want to work with you or want to be associated with you, you have brand positioning, you have brand equity. You have also power to actually dictate where you want the product to go. And here, as we are known for profit, we have also other strategic goals that do serve the SDGs. And I think for me, I think the, the, one of the main challenges for the next decade would be to, as I'm positioning innovation as business transformation, 
it will be how do you combine the business transformation with the SDGs or with a real impact in terms of how we think and how do we measure our success? Not just by selling more or having more data or, or you know, the market side of things, but at the end of the day, it's how you change the metrics. And this is also something on the public authorities and the governing bodies like yours to actually say maybe GDP is not the right way to measure things. And this is also where we are confronted to, to a certain extent, because at the end of the day, people are telling us, okay, but how much money or how much value do you provide to the organization? And that's the same for everybody. So mixing the two will be the key needs for the decade to come. Excellent, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. And I think that Martin, you have your, your hand raised. Are you, uh, do you have a question? Do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, hi, John. My my name is Martin. Uh, I'm the licensed uh, trainer DOSP, and um, I, I have no new question. I just uh, want to uh, catch up the last one from Fiona because it was very interesting, and from the practice point of view, uh, I could uh, give some input to that. And what uh, John Baptist says, um, yeah, is uh, again one digital solution. Uh, for the individual's child. And we had a very good and big experience uh, last week where we started our training with all the childs. Uh, we was afraid that maybe only the half of the childs uh, come to practice, but in the end we had 98% uh, of the childs <laughs> in our training. So we, we really were surprised about that. And uh, I think the point why we got this big success was that we had in the meantime of Corona, online contact to the child, online practicing training, what was not exactly the same as the physical training, of course, but uh, in the end, very important that the child all came to practice was that they want to have the socializing. And I think that was very, very important for them. Socializing, that was what Fiona said also for the health aspect, that the child want to make uh, sports activities together. So not a bad idea, Jean-Baptiste, about the digital one, but it could be just supplement of uh, getting together, making together sports at the fresh air. Uh, thanks uh, that I could contribute that. Thank you very much for your, your input there, Martin. Um, we have come to the end of, uh, of, our, of our time today. Um, I would very much like to thank uh, Anna, Jean-Baptiste and Hisham for all your input. Um, this was a very well attended session. Um, people wanted to hear what you had to say and I don't think uh, you disappointed them. So thanks to all three of you very much. Um, thank you to my co-host Guillermo for your help and your input. And uh, most importantly, thanks to everyone for joining today. Um, we very much look forward to welcoming you to the next chat. Um, so keep an eye on your inboxes for the next invitation. And uh, just a final goodbye and thank you everyone once again. Mm -hmm.